Well, I'm smiling, but really don't feel like I should be. It's lasted eight months and they're back. I hate to say it, let's find out all about it. And we are in. So we are looking at the spider mite magnet that is Brugmansia. So I can't show you this in bloom because these fantastically large blooms only open at twilight. So at the moment in the UK, that's about nine o'clock. So when it begins to get dark and the grow lights go off, this thing opens up. Now I've had this a number of years, five, six years, something like that. And it's always been a magnet for spider mites. And you can see the damage. You can see what begins to happen. The leaves start to mottle and it's clear that something is going on. It loses its vigor and leaves begin to drop off. Now it's such a shame because I've had my sulfur hot box, which is just right above it there for obvious reasons. I've had that for eight months now and it's been running for eight months on and off, mostly on, sometimes off, sometimes over in the hot house. And it's done fantastically well for me. It's really made a difference. But I noticed probably about two weeks ago that one or two of these leaves lower down were beginning to yellow. And when I looked, I could see one or two mites. So I thought, well, I'll get the hot box in here and I will just put it on in here on a nightly basis. Now, the protocol that they give you is like an initial blast for a couple of nights and then on and off like a maintenance thing of a couple of hours, one night, then leave it, then another couple of hours, another night and so on and just keep alternating like that. I went over and above and I've done it practically every night for the last couple of weeks and the mites have just continued to build to the point that nearly all of these below where my hand is have mites and it's only like this last remaining little section here that doesn't have mites. Now I have to say I have caved and I have sprayed it. I sprayed it with a systemic. Now that's the first time I've sprayed since I got the sulfur hot box. So what's going on? Well, I haven't a clue. I really don't know. I have read that the sulfur that comes from the hot box uh, is something that the spider mites cannot breathe. It interferes with their breathing. So you would not expect them to become resistant to something that interferes with their breathing. You know, think about something that like a human would uh, endure. You know, if we went into a building that had some chemical in it that we couldn't breathe or some dust in the air, we wouldn't get used to it. And that's the way I'm thinking about it anyway. There definitely seems to be a distinct lack of information on the net about this kind of thing. So I've reached out to, to Hotbox International who actually make these things to ask them one or two questions. Is it simply the case that I've not been running it long enough? Could it be that I need to run it for seven hours a night, you know, every night for a week? Will that make a difference? Will they still come back after that? Would it make any difference if I change the sulfur more regularly? Because you're not told this. The sulfur that goes in this little container here, just about see it there, the sulfur crystals that go in there, they do seem to last quite a long time in as much as you can still see it in the container. It melts, then it re-solidifies, then it melts, then it re-solidifies, and you can seem to be able to do that in perpetuity. However, the aroma that you can smell from the thing definitely does drop off just after a couple of uses. You can smell it really strongly at first and then the second time, the third time, the fourth time, hardly at all to the point that you, you just don't, you know, after a week you don't smell it at all even though it's been on overnight. So these are the questions that I want answers to. I am actually going to try and I've, I've completely changed the sulfur crystals in the recently. I did that yesterday. I am going to try and leave it on six hours a night and see what happens. There's no reason why not. It's perfectly safe. Uh, I just want to see whether it does kill them off completely. Now, I've kind of ruined the experiment a little bit in that I've sprayed the Brugmansia with a systemic insecticide. But as I've discovered in the past, that only lasts for a certain length of time and then they do become resistant to that, that we do know. 
So it's a shame. I want to keep this in the greenhouse just to see what happens. I don't want to put it outside. Basically what happens every year when I put it outside, it gets knocked back. But just by spraying it with the insecticide, that can also, it also has an effect. When it's a systemic, uh, that can affect certain plants. And I found that it does affect Brugmansia um, negatively. So let's see what happens. I mean, at the moment, it's in a good spot though. It's kind of out of the way. I'm quite happy with it. It's getting bigger and it was looking really, really good, better than it's ever looked. And then the pesky little blighters have come back again. And uh, I'm worried that they will spread to other things. So let's see what happens. If anybody out there has any more experience with those, let me know how you've uh, dealt with it because of course these things are used in commercial greenhouses so they've got to work haven't they surely okay so that's the first thing that's the first little whinge but we've got quite a number of things to look at in here and we're just going to move over here and look at something that i'm sure you're going to enjoy much more than the talk of spider mites so over here we have two dendrobiums. Unfortunately, you've just kind of missed this one. If you follow me on Instagram, and if you don't, have a look at the link in the description, and you can do. This is Dendrobium thersiflorum, and it's just closing up. These blooms are just going over now. Been very, very nice, very pretty. That's the first time it's bloomed. I've had that since 2020. This one is at the moment anyway, looking much nicer, of course. This is Dendrobium densiflorum. This is its second year of blooming for me. Beautiful thing. That one does have a little scent. I can't detect anything on this one, but you may be able to see that it's pretty crispy. It's not looking that healthy. Neither of them are looking that healthy. I did lose a cane this year for reasons that I can't really figure out other than I just don't think it's getting enough water. I think the problem with growing orchids in this country is you could do with changing the media in summer and in winter. You could do with probably changing it to something more dry in winter and changing it to something uh, with more moisture retention in summer. However, I can't do that. I'm not going to do that clearly. But what I want to do with these is, re is actually put them in a pot, unmount them, get them in pots if I can, and hopefully they will do better for me next year and throw up some more canes that will actually uh, survive and thrive and not go dead like that one. So I'll leave you with the bloom there. That looks really, really nice. And that one, not quite as nice as the photographs I've shown on Instagram. Now, I just want a quick word about these. I've been saying it wrong all along. So these are not in Patians. I had no idea I've been pronouncing it in Patians all my life, as I know lots of other local people do. I mean, okay, what's in a pronunciation doesn't really matter. However, I believe the word in Patian is actually, yeah, how it looks, impatient. It comes from the word impatient. So these are impatience. Um, if Kathy is watching, no doubt she will tell me she was right all along. But the fact that they explode their seed heads, if you've ever seen an impatient, actually uh, spread its seeds. When the seed head gets touched, you just touch it very gently and it poof, explodes. Little sound effect for you as well. Explodes all over the place. I did actually do a slow-mo of one once. Uh, you can see them in the ones in the fields because we do have like a Himalayan one, Himalayan balsam, I believe it's called, and that does spread far and wide. It's an invader. But these are looking really good now, really big, and hopefully these won't catch the little spider mites, which are now in the greenhouse at large again. So yeah, there's something else about these as well. This one, Niam Niamensis, apparently you can eat these. You can eat the leaves as like a vegetable, so presumably you have to cook it. Um, the discovery of it was made in 1909, and I can't remember the country, was it Borneo, something like that? I can't remember where it was, but Niam Niam, the second part of the name, is named after the people or the tribe, are we allowed to say tribe these days, the people that lived in the area where they were growing. And they prefer to grow in moist spots. They do not like it hot, and this is why both of these very, very quickly wilt in this greenhouse. I have recently potted them up as I've potted up the mandevilla, a couple of mandevilla laxes at the back then. And as we know, there is a bougainvillea there as well, which is going to do fantastically well for me this year. That's going to be its best ever, hopefully. While we're over in this area, remember my beautiful mandevilla 
vine, my Sanderi, Diplodenia, loads of names for it. It's back in bud and look, it's coming back and it's spreading over here. I don't know what I'm going to do when it gets over here because it's going to clash with these other climbers. I'll have to take it in the other direction or perhaps up the roof there. But I'm really pleased that's coming. It's actually been in bud ages. The good thing about these flowers is when they open, they last a long time, but when they're in bud, they seem to be in bud for weeks. They take ages, not as long as orchids. Nothing seems to take as long as orchids. So I have another mandevilla over here. This one is a, a more rose colored one, a pink colored one. So hopefully that one will also start to come out very, very soon. And that's working its way all over the place. It's got to compete with this uh, frilly thing here. This is my fern, which is not a fern. It's actually an asparagus. It's not a fern really, but we know it's called an asparagus fern. And it's just going all over the place. I need to cut some of those back because this is actually a climber, I believe. It's got very sharp spikes on it, which hook onto things just in the manner as you can see there. So I could do with cutting some of those back. My Dracula orchid over here, which didn't really do that well. It was all looking like it was gonna to do tons of blooms. And then I actually heard some information from somebody who, I think it was a commercial, no it was, it was a commercial grower, and they grew loads and loads of these things, just Dracula orchids, and they said, I think it was a UK grower actually, and they said, put it in the darkest corner of the greenhouse. Now it was in the darkest corner, it isn't anymore because the sun's come up over, so I could do in moving it. But it also said, put it on a tray and fill it with water just like you do with some carnivorous plants and you know what it made all the difference and within a few weeks we've got all these growths coming and some growths inside so i'm looking forward to getting some actual blooms on this thing i'm keeping it permanently wet now i do not let it dry out at all so that's a little bit of information on dracula orchids so hopefully that will do its thing for me very soon now I'm not going to go through all my Drosera here. They're all, a lot of them anyway, a lot of the Drosera capensis are in bloom. But this is the first year I've actually had a red form Drosera capensis bloom for me. And who knew? It actually has got pink flowers. I didn't know that. I expected it to have white flowers like the other ones. But yeah, that's great. It's really nice to see. They are quite cute. I certainly wouldn't say they're spectacular, but they're all right. They look quite nice close up and from a distance. So yeah, we've got some lovely pink blooms and you can see how they are successional. So you, you'll have those will open, they'll close, and the next two will open and they'll close and so on. Dendrobium Cuthbertsonii over here, that definitely had spider mite and this is its first re-blooming after the spider mite. So we've got that one just about to open. Oh, I'll just help it a little bit. There we go. And then we've got a few more buds there coming. Another couple over there. So that's looking great. Mastervalia ignea going to to bloom again. I've just actually fed these. I don't believe Mastervalia need a great deal of feeding. And I, ha I actually haven't fed them at all since I bought them. I've had these several years, but you can see how these leaves are yellowing. So I thought, we'll give them a little bit of feed and see what happens. I know I did a video all about this. It's good to see it from a distance actually. So this is my species Streptocarpus, the unifoliate. You can see the difference between that huge leaf and all the ordinary Streptocarpus, the hybrids over there. And you can see how spectacular the blooms look. They really look better than I anticipated. Uh, looking it up, there are actually quite a number of species Streptocarpus unifoliate. So I've ordered another one. Not the same one, one with an even bigger leaf than this one. So hopefully that will come soon. I ordered that from Dibley's if you're in the UK. Well worth looking up. Streps are beginning to come now. These are actually quite late and I'm wondering whether I actually overfed them a little too early. I do believe that if you feed them too much, it's at the expense of blooms for more leaves. Uh, it's never, I've never really fed them as much as this, I don't think, in the past. I know Dibblers recommend the proprietary tablet once a month, which I've done from March, but I think it was probably a little too early. 
and it's meant it's kind of knocked them back a bit because they've put on all this vegetative growth. However, they are actually looking very, very healthy and there are loads and loads of buds now, loads to come. It'd be interesting to actually ask Dibleys about this. I don't know if anybody watches who's involved in Dibleys. No doubt that isn't something that is happening. However, it would be great to see how they get those to bloom because I saw an Instagram photo the other day and all those are in bloom. What's the difference? More light, higher temperatures earlier on in the year? I'd like to know. I really would like to know how they get them to bloom so much earlier. Like I say, I think I probably fed them a little too much, a little too early. So they are beginning to come now. Lots of things are beginning to come. Of course, it's May, the sun's out, it's looking great. I'm gonna have a go this year at growing a tuberous begonia. Now I can't say that this is something to like shout from the rooftops about. It is a much easier to grow something like this in a greenhouse. But it was a free gift. I joined the Begonia Society over in the UK. I also joined the American one. But the one in the UK sent me a free uh, tuberous begonia. So let's see what happens. So this would be big, big blousy blooms, which I like. I do like them. But I also like my uh, leaf type varieties, which are much more unusual, a little bit different. You know, this longiciliata is a favourite of mine. And you can see that all the pelagoniums are looking absolutely superb. Sorry about the light at the back there. I'll turn that off and then you can see them a little bit better. Okay, that's much better. Okay, so working our way through them. So that one is a beautiful one, but it's not in bloom yet. It has been in bloom, actually. It's just going through a little quieter phase. So we've got the Angel Pelagonium here. I've ordered another one of these, or like not the same one, obviously. This is SK Verglo. It looks really, really nice close up. We've got another beautiful one there that I can't remember the name of. That one's just gone over, but it'll come back again in a few weeks. We've got Tornado there, a Regal one. You know I love the Regals. We've got this one over here is Georgia, another favourite of mine now. This is one that I've had for years. This Stella one over here is looking particularly great at the moment. This is St. Elmo's Fire. Uh, this salmon coloured one is Kamal, looking fabulous. One of my original ones, which did get some kind of mite, this is why it's looking a bit of a funny shape. So this one is Arnside Fringed Aztec. Remember Arnside after the guy who actually named it, that was where he used to live, Arnside Close, I believe. This one is a new favourite of mine, had this about a year, but this is the first blooming for it, and this one is my chance beautiful colours, very unusual colours actually for Pelagonium. I've got my species at the back there, they're just beginning to come into bloom now so there's nothing really to show there. Anyone who watched the last vlog I did in here will have seen that my Lelia Anceps, I had it in too dark a spot. Since I've given it the light now, shown it the light, we've got a nice new growth there, a nice new root coming down there and it does dry, it's in purely moss now, it does dry out every day from where it is, which is what it wants, of course, it wants to dry out. So I give that a sprinkle every day of water. So things are really coming on and looking the business, I think, at the moment. Now this Vanda down here, this is proper thumb gold, never bloomed for me and I've had it such a long time repotted it in April this year and it, you can see it's not looking that healthy. I thought to myself, well, I mean, it was actually just hanging. It was, the, the roots were just completely bare. And I thought, well, it's lasted about four or five years with no blooms whatsoever. Let's try it in a pot. So I've just got it in very, very loose, chunky coconut husks. So let's see what happens with that, whether it makes any difference. It certainly can't make it worse, can it, other than kill it. I've got another orchid which is about to bloom back here, Prostechia radiata. This one does seem to do well for me. A couple of bloom spikes there, some new growth coming on it down there. I thought I'd try growing, because it, it's not done that well for me this year. So this is a, a Dendrobium noble, just one of the cheap ones, had it several years. But I thought I'd put it in some Lekka, see what happens. I've never grown in Lekka before. It's certainly looking okay and it's got quite a number of new canes coming on that so hopefully that will do the business for me over in the springtime next year should be when that blooms or certainly towards the end of the year at least 
One of the most favourite orchids I ever had was my Burragira Nellyila. This one is red velvet. And I had it for a couple of years and I didn't realise at the time that it, it's kind of an intermediate. It doesn't really want to go as low as 12. It really wants to keep about 15 plus. So the one that I had, I think it probably got spider mites as well, actually. It did really well and then it died and I've always missed it. I've missed the fantastic blooms that it had and I also miss the scent that it gave off as well. So I thought I'd give it another go. I have to say, I got this from my should I say, usual eBay seller that people are probably familiar with. If I mention the word rare, you'll know who I'm talking about. And as per usual, practically every plant I get from there is completely rootless. And this was no exception, nothing on it whatsoever. So I've got to try and nurse it back to life. Now you might say, well, why use that seller? Well, I use them because they're cheaper. And I consider it uh, a risk worth taking sometimes when i get them they do have roots very often they don't and in this case it doesn't but it's not cost me a lot so you know i can i can kind of see the argument for both i could go and pay triple the amount and be certain that it had roots and you know be able to go back to them and say look it's not got any roots or it's not looking too healthy give me another one but i've decided to risk it and in this case uh, it remains to be seen whether it's going to pay off or not. So quick sweep around, you can see things are looking really nice. Obviously we're not in the hot house at the moment. The hot house at the moment is full of more foliage types, not a great deal in bloom over there at the moment. Hopefully that will change as time goes on. So I think that's all there is to catch up on at the moment. If I've missed anything out, please put it into the comments, let me know what you think about what's going on in here. Some lovely pictures still coming, look this one up here, look. This one has attached itself to the railing, can you see there? This is what they do, so it is actually climbing, doing its thing. There's another one there attached to the railing. I'm gonna run out of space with those, aren't I? This one's really going for it, loads of tubby, I like a nice tubby picture. I certainly, I always want more of these. Anything with VCI I would love, but I just can't bring myself around to paying the amounts that they want for them at the moment. Perhaps I will at some point, but at the moment, no, it's not happening. Um, if anyone wants to do any trades, I'd certainly be up for that. If it's something I want and something you want, you know how to contact me. So, for now, I will see you on the next one. Bye.